Some events leave a deep mark on history, but none on the land. This is the site of the Battle of Hastings. After almost a thousand years, no traces of the bloody conflict can be seen. But here, the fate of England turned. It's where a king was killed and his victor claimed the throne. October 14th, 1066. We know what happened here on this day, thanks to this. The Bayer Tapestry. A carefully preserved illustrated record of events. It shows the main players. Harold, the newly crowned Anglo-Saxon King of England, and his challenger, William. Duke of Normandy. William claimed the previous king had promised him the crown. So, he assembled an army and prepared to sail to England to fight King Harold for the throne. But a storm thwarted his plans. Meanwhile, Harold discovered that a Viking invasion had landed in the north another threat to his crown, so he raced to fight them. In France, William waited for the right conditions to sail across the Channel to England. The weather cleared. He seized his chance. Two hundred and fifty miles north, Harold had defeated the Vikings. Now, hearing of William's arrival, his army sped south. At nine o'clock in the morning, on this hill, William's Norman army were ready to do battle with Harold's Anglo-Saxon men. The stage was set, and up for grabs, England itself. Battle of Hastings, the death of one man changed the course of history. The Anglo-Saxon King Harold was killed here, on England's south coast. His army defeated by William of Normandy. Anglo-Saxon rule was over forever. At Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day 1066, William was crowned the first Norman King of England. Now he had to secure power across the country. He began by stamping his mark on the landscape, building cathedrals and castles at strategic locations. Nothing like them had been seen in England before. They reminded the Anglo-Saxon population exactly who was in charge. But not all were content with living under Norman rule. Anglo-Saxon revolts broke out across the country. King William acted quickly to crush these rebellions. But there was one region where dissent was spiraling out of control. The north of England. In 1069, a group of lords from Northumbria formed an alliance with Viking invaders. Together they approached Norman-held York, a large city with an important cathedral, still protected by ancient Roman walls. But the walls couldn't save York. The city and the castle fell to the rebels. William's new kingdom was under threat. He had to get the city back under Norman control. William had no choice but to order his men north. 
Give her help still, but as the Norman forces set off on their long march towards York, how much resistance from the rebels would they encounter? William the Conqueror had recaptured York from the rebels. Now he wanted to teach them a lesson for defying him. He began a brutal campaign of destruction to crush any further resistance, known as the harrying of the North. Villages and crops were destroyed. It is said a hundred thousand people were killed. With ruthless efficiency, William the Conqueror had secured obedience in his new kingdom. But it wasn't to last. It would be thrown into chaos by his own children. When William the Conqueror died in 1087, his favorite son succeeded him, King William II, known as William Rufus. But 13 years into his reign, disaster struck. While out hunting, he was killed. William's youngest brother took his place as King Henry I. But there was a problem. At the time, Henry's elder brother, Robert, Duke of Normandy, had been on crusade. When he returned, he was furious that Henry had grabbed the throne. From Normandy, Robert attempted to invade England to claim the crown from his brother but he failed and returned home. In retaliation, Henry struck back. In a reversal of 1066, he crossed the channel and invaded Normandy, intent on undermining his brother Robert's rule. His first target was Bayer. This rich and splendid city was one of the jewels of Normandy. Henry was to begin his campaign by unleashing his forces on the city. Bayer was about to feel the wrath of the English army. While Bayer burned, King Henry pressed his advantage seizing key fortifications and buying the loyalty of powerful lords, Henry loosened his brother's grip over Normandy. At Tinchebray in 1106, brother would fight brother for final claim to their father's lands. William the Conqueror's sons had resolved their long feud over Normandy with King Henry resting possession away from his brother. But the French King Louis VI would not accept Henry's heir as the future Duke of Normandy. Henry's fragile power would face its first test, an invasion by the French King. After England defeated the French at the Battle of Brimule, Normandy was back in King Henry's hands. But one year later, his good fortune turned to tragedy. In 1120, his son and heir William Adeline died in a shipwreck. The future of Henry I's kingdom was in jeopardy. Henry desperately needed a new heir. With no legitimate sons left alive, he broke with tradition and chose his daughter, Matilda. Henry forced his barons to swear an oath to accept Matilda as queen. But when the king died, they broke their promise. England would not be ruled by a woman. 
Matilda's cousin Stephen saw his chance and claimed the throne. The crisis moved to the capital. At Westminster Abbey, Stephen was crowned king, but Matilda wanted what was hers. She was also lining up powerful supporters who would fight Stephen for her right to rule. Their conflict engulfed England in civil war. Fighting raged throughout the land. In 1141, everything focused on one of the kingdom's most strategic cities, Lincoln. Matilda's allies had commandeered the castle. But King Stephen was determined to take it back. He besieged the castle. Stalemate. As dawn broke on February the 2nd, everything was about to change. Matilda's half-brother, Robert of Gloucester, raced to break the siege. As Robert's forces approached Lincoln, Stephen's army turned away from the castle to face them. Robert could win Matilda the crown, but only if his army could win the day. Victory over King Stephen at Lincoln gave Matilda the upper hand in her fight for the English crown. But in the years that followed, fragile loyalties shifted, and under threat of capture, Matilda was forced to retreat. As her holdings in England came under attack from the king's army, it fell to her son Henry to keep Matilda's claim to the throne alive. Wallingford, in the shadow of the castle. Matilda's faction, commanded by her son Henry, proved it was still willing to fight King Stephen for the crown. But after 15 years of conflict, both sides had had enough. So, they made a deal. Matilda would surrender her claim to the throne on condition that when Stephen died, her eldest living son Henry would succeed him. A year later, he was crowned King Henry II and proceeded to grow the kingdom into the mighty Angevin Empire. But, once again, what the king had spent his life building, his own children were destined to destroy. King Henry II had four surviving legitimate sons and he planned to divide up his kingdom between them. But they fought bitterly for dominance. Against the odds, Henry's youngest son, John, became king. But King John was deeply unpopular. He lost huge swathes of the Angevin Empire gained by his father, then failed to reclaim them in expensive battles. Paid for by taxing his subjects. Eventually, England's barons could take it no more. They forced John to agree to a charter that restricted his power. The Magna Carta. But he went against his word. Furious, they rebelled, inviting Prince Louis of France to invade England. In 1216, Louis sailed to Dover and set his sights on taking this. Dover Castle. Held by forces loyal to King John, it was commanded by Hubert de Burr. He described the castle as the key to England. He was right. If it fell to the French, so would the kingdom. prior to the defense of Dover, 
King John's defiance of the Magna Carta had mired England in a rebellion known as the First Baron's War. Across England, barons broke ties with the crown and seized important cities, including Rochester. With his reign under threat, John deployed his forces to retake Rochester and capture the traitors. When forces loyal to King John undermined Rochester Castle, it spelled doom for the rebels inside. Within days, they had surrendered. But the rebel barons weren't done yet. Their ally, Prince Louis of France, had sent an invasion force to help the barons overthrow King John. Then, in late 1216, the king fell ill with dysentery and died. His son, just nine years old, was crowned King Henry III. It was now up to the young king's regent, the 70-year-old legendary knight William Marshall, to protect the crown. He faced a near impossible challenge. England was crumbling. Rebels were taking town after town. But William Marshall bided his time and prepared to defeat the rebels. Then in May 1217, he got the chance that he'd been waiting for. William discovered that the rebels planned to simultaneously besiege both Dover Castle and Lincoln Castle. With rebel forces split and weakened, William Marshall led his royalist army to Lincoln. The castle on one side of the city was still controlled by royalists, under its formidable constable, Lady Nicola de la Haye. But the streets of the city were under rebel control. On May 20th, 1217, the Royalist Relief Force, led by William Marshall, arrived to retake the rebel-controlled city. The future of England rode on the success of this mission. William Marshall's success in retaking Lincoln was an overwhelming victory for the Royalists. The rebel barons had been defeated and their French allies driven out of England altogether. <laughs> William Marshall now focused on creating a stable kingdom for the young King Henry III. To maintain the backing of the rebels, in 1217, a royal seal of approval was given to a reissued Magna Carta, limiting the power of the monarchy. Many barons held lands in both England and Normandy. But now they faced a choice. On which side of the channel would they make their home? Many chose England. The cross-channel kingdom was over establishing a clear English identity. But the impact of the Normans on England's evolution is still felt today. Almost a thousand years later, the surviving Norman castles and cathedrals still dominate the landscape. In the midst of the modern city, William the Conqueror's fortress, the Tower of London, remains a powerful reminder of their legacy. But it's the unseen influence of the Normans that endures.
the Norman invasion changed the English language and established the foundations of modern parliament and governance. And it's all because one man, William the Conqueror, claimed the English crown that he believed by rights was his. The Normans conquered a country and changed the course of England forever.